Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Charlie Garrell. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield College. It's October 29th, 2019. Charlie, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate this. Uh, start, start you off with a nice, easy question today. Sure. Which is, why wine? Why wine? That is a wonderful question, actually. Why wine? It, for me, it was a return to intellectual pursuit as much as anything else. It's passion. And you'll find most people in the industry are drawn to it because of some sort of deep caring about it. That said, under the umbrella of wine, I grew to realize my, this is, I all, I've said for a number of years now, and in some ways this is all my wife's fault because she bought me a wine class and I've come <laughs> full circle to food and wine in my life. It's always been a major passion, even when I wasn't in the industry. But I started attending wine school back in 2007, and it was while doing my first formal academic study of wine at the International Wine Guild in Denver, Colorado, that I just realized the number of tangential subjects, not just wine, but history, his, arguably history of Western civilization can be viewed through the, wine, the lens of the wine grape, geology, fermentation science, agriculture in general, all the different vessels, approaches, techniques, all of the information, and it is never ending. And just when you think you have a decent foundation and an understanding, you start to realize just how much more there is to learn. So it was really my first few wine classes that I grew to realize that this is the intellectual pursuit that has captured both my passion and my intellect at the same time, and that as much as I'm pursuing and trying to learn as quickly as possible and continue to do so, it really is never ending. And there is always more to learn and always more to know. And I find the most capable people in the industry often are some of the most modest and they are almost awed by the scope of what we are involved with. Mm -hmm. And so that is what, in a, in a nutshell, what has brought me to wine is this combination of the love of the product and the love of the intellect surrounding the product. Willamette Valley in particular, when I made my first visit up here in 2008, I was bowled over at not just the beauty of the valley, quality of the wines, but even more importantly to me, it was the passion of the people in the industry and the collegiality of the industry. And it struck me as so much different than any other businesses that I had ever been involved with or associated with or op observing in that there, I believe to this day there is still an ongoing goal in our valley, this thought, thought that the rising tide is going to raise all ships and, and we know our neighbor is not going to be able to make the same thing we do. So we don't have the same product. We have a similar product perhaps, but we don't have the same product and we want the world to know about the quality that we're producing here. So the better my neighbor is doing, the better the bottle that the consumer anywhere in the world experiences from the Willamette Valley, the better it is for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's rare in any industry where you have people producing a product that is similar to one another and yet you're cheerleaders for mm -hmm. one another at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there was something just so exceptional about that to me and continues to be. And despite all the changes and the evolution of the industry, the growth of the industry, how much money is involved now, all of that, I find the willingness for people to drop everything to help their neighbor, whether it's advice, equipment, time, mm -hmm opinion, whatever it is, that willingness, and, and in fact, it's beyond willingness, it's almost obligatory around here. Eagerness. You, you, yeah. eager, yes, eagerness is a very good word for it. And, and so, why wine and why the Willamette Valley? I think that that, that probably covers, covers it. You mentioned food and wine being kind of a part of your life, even if it wasn't what you were officially doing. Yeah. Tell us about what you were doing before you came to the Valley and, and sort of the, the role wine, food and wine was playing. Sure. So I really came full circle. Out of college, I worked about a decade in the restaurant industry, stints in very high-end fine dining restaurants, stints in ethnic restaurants, and that was my first in-depth exposure to wine, wine and food at, at a very high level. Uh, and did that for about a decade and 
then grew restless as I want to do and uh, opened up a painting business in Boulder, Colorado. And I was very lucky because it was the era that Boulder was transforming, turning from a sleepy, ver very small, liberal college town to the entrepreneurial hub that it is today and the corresponding growth in real estate and the building boom that then happened and I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time to be painting buildings and uh, helping that, that community grow and, ch and change. All through that, I continued to probably eat and drink well beyond my means and probably still continue to do that as most of us do in the industry. Although if you look at the amount of money that Americans spend relatively on food and drink relative to our European friends. Uh, we are just spending too little, in my opinion. It's not that people in the industry are spending too much. Um, it's just a matter of what you value in life. And so I did about 15 years as a painting contractor and uh, enjoyed it. It was a, a Good, 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 productive thing to be doing. Um, but all along, I continue to pursue drinking wine, food, and that has always been one of the things that I find most enjoyable in life. Uh, food, wine, and music are what get me up in the morning, and that my family. Th those are my my real passions and loves in life, and so that continued all through the time that I was a contractor. Uh, but then I was complaining to my wife that I was not being intellectually stimulated enough. I wasn't meeting the people who had sympathetic interest in food, wine, and music. And same week I was really complaining about this, she bought me a wine class at an accredited school in Denver and said, here, go learn something, meet some people who like food and wine. I said, great, thank you. I don't have to take this test at the end though, do I? And she said, no, no, just go. I got to the first class and it was like a light bulb moment. Sometimes in life you get these just realizations and it was really in my one of my very first classes that, that I realized not only how enjoyable this was but this was something that I wanted to continue to pursue and learn a whole lot more about and so sure enough I did take the test at the end of that first uh, series of classes and wound up continuing to go to International Wine Guild wound up earning what they call a certified senior seller masters uh, certificate from them equivalent to Court of Sommeliers or WSET level 2 mm -hmm. for people in the industry most of the formal academic studies of wine tend to have tiers mm -hmm. and levels to them usually broken down into four separate tiers always considered to be more difficult uh, drastically really as you go up the tiers uh, so much so that getting a, a level four master sommelier or a master of wine is one of the hardest professional certifications in the world you start to think that there's only somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 mm -hmm. of each of these accredited people globally so under 700 put together of these two certifications there's more brain surgeons than that so people are able to get through and become you know very sophisticated in various endeavors that are very, very complex, and yet it is the notoriety of just how difficult it is to get that level four that makes this a pinnacle achievement in, in the wine industry and, and kind of continues to, we're lucky enough in Oregon to have several masters of wine working in our industry here and for such a small state. It's remarkable how educationally focused we are and, and how many heavy hitters are, are working in our, in our local industry here. So how did that education and that kind of desire to continue the experience lead you to the Wyoming Valley? Yeah, great question. Uh, I have a very close friend who I take frequent vacations with, and one year, after just after I'd earned my level two senior seller manager from uh, Wine Guild, he suggested that we come to the Willamette Valley and then go fishing off of the Oregon coast for a vacation. I said, wonderful, that sounds like a great vacation. I've never been there before. I had happened to have just done a seminar on Oregon wines, and I had been very intrigued by the quality of Oregon wines. So I was eager to come up and see what was happening here. 
And after that long weekend visit here, I came back from that vacation telling my wife, that's it, I don't know what I want to do in wine, but I want to close the paint business, I want to move the family up to Oregon, I want to go do something in wine. She said, yes, dear, get a year round full time with health care benefits and we'll talk. And <laughs> so, so thinking that would be the end of the story and I pursued it, got lucky enough, and was offered a job managing a tasting room here in the Valley, and uh, took that job and relocated up here, and that was my, my first job in the Valley, was managing August Sellers Tasting Room up in the Chehalem Mountains. Uh, this is a facility that I think they have eight or nine, perhaps, brands working currently. Uh, alternating tenancy, I think, is what they call it in Oregon and California, custom crush facility. In other words, one, uh, ownership owns the building, owns the major equipment, others come in with their own brands and their own licensing and all of that and just produce their wines within the same facility. So I felt very blessed to get that job because it immediately got me connected in the industry in a way few jobs I think could have having access to nine different winemakers, all with different approaches, all pulling fruit from all over the Pacific Northwest, not just the Willamette Valley, being a, and being in a facility that is a gravity flow, underground cellar caves to store the barrels in, all of this added up to being just a crash course education in the nuts and bolts of working in the industry because as I grew to realize very quickly that academic knowledge is one thing, actually working in a trade is a whole nother thing and like so many other businesses, it's always who you know, right? And this is so much in life. So I was very blessed because the who I got to know happened very quickly. And there are some wonderful, wonderful producers in there. And this was a continuation of what I had sensed as a visitor and consumer and proved to be the reality that people in this valley are extremely generous with their time, their knowledge, their passion, their backstories. Mm -hmm. It's really been remarkable and continues to be, um, and, and many people love nothing more than to talk about what they're doing, and I find that that tends to be what I enjoy the most, and that's how I've wound up what I'm doing currently in the tour business, is I talk about wine all day long. That That is what I love doing, and I love to try to help people to get a better handle on the greater story of wine the Willamette Valley and how we are fitting into it. Mm -hmm. And it's been incredibly rewarding. So that, that's in a nutshell how I wound up doing what I'm doing doing now. That passion for talking about wine keeps us going too, as yep. you can imagine. Yeah. So tell me about the idea for wine tourism for Oregon. You started Oregon Wine Guide. Tell me about how yeah. the, that idea came to you and then getting it started. Yeah. Well, I'd worked for successively more wonderful or, or just a series of wonderful brands. And I, it's the old self-knowledge. I know what I tend to like to do and be good at doing and what I am more challenged at doing. And I knew I had more or less sealinged out in the wineries in terms of I've always been in the sales and hospitality end of things, even running my paint business. Yes, I did labor, but sales, and customer relations were a big part of what my role was in, in my business. And, and so I really had realized that I was sealing doubt in, with what my skill sets are and what I wanted to do in terms of wineries. My last job was at the Venerable White Rose Estate up in the Dundee Hills, um, a terrific producer. I really enjoyed my job there. Uh, but I also realized that I, I, I wasn't going to, there was no more positions for me to move into there. And I started to realize that uh, my restlessness kicking in perhaps in a way, uh, but talking about one brand over and over again, one set of wines over and over again, no matter how good or how interesting, is somewhat limiting. And I, all along ha have been particularly enthusiastic by the diversity of what's going on here, both in the wines themselves, 
the personalities behind them, the ambiances, the experiences that are being created, and this is rapidly changing and growing. We're, we're cur currently seeing, I think, some uh, major, major changes happening in the valley. Um, all along, we've been striving for quality, and I think probably in the first eras of wine in the valley, that quality was very much product-centric, mm -hmm. where the whole goal was make the very best possible bottles of wine. That's still the bulk of our producer's objective, is to be making the best possible bottles of wine. Along with that, and I think not coincidentally with the rise of our land prices, our fruit prices, and hence our average bottle price point, Many people in the industry grew to realize, well, it was one thing when a bottle of wine was eight, nine, ten, fifteen dollars. When a bottle of wine is twenty-five, fifty, a hundred dollars plus and going up, mm -hmm. the type of consumer who is going to be eager to come visit us, the type of experiences that we're offering needed to rise so that they met with the quality of the wine and frankly with the price ask that we are now doing with our bottles here. So experience is becoming as important a factor of the wine business here, I believe, as the quality of our product. And I think that that is a factor that we have, have tremendous advantages on because this has always been such a diverse region, not just in terms of our microclimates and the various wines, but the types of people who've become involved mm -hmm. and the way their personalities are then illustrated through the, t the design and architecture of the buildings to the type of hospitalities that they are offering. And I think that there is a, a much bandied about term these days in our valley called enhanced experiences. And I think that enhanced experience is becoming the normal experience out here. If you are not enhancing and really treating a wine tasting as a whole experience, you're rapidly falling behind in the game here in the valley. And the era of drive down a dirt road, a sign that spray painted taste wine today, and somebody jumps off a tractor and says, you're here to taste wine, wait a few minutes, I'll go get the Dixie Cups. That era is long, long gone. And for the good and the bad of that, because there's a certain joy to the authenticity of showing up at a farmer's house and having a non-pretentious, low price pointed, mm -hmm. wonderful, authentic Oregon experience. There are still a smattering of those to be found in the valley, but fewer and fewer as time goes on. As that price point has gone up, the expectation I think has rightfully risen and we are meeting what the consumer is looking for, I believe, here, and looking for ways to grow upon what we're already doing. I, I think the thought process wheels are going across the valley currently of how not just to keep up, but how to be inventive, mm -hmm. how to do creative things, how to stand out, how to make the experience especially unusual and inviting to a guest with what you were doing. And, and it looks different for, for the different brands and, the, and so much of this again comes back down to people's personalities and backgrounds. And, and there's this often bandied about term of authenticity and how important that is. On a marketing sense, that can have a hollow ring to it, but we know it when we see it. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. feel it when you show up and people really care about what they're doing. It is far different than when they are just running a business. And mm -hmm. we have that in spades here in the mm -hmm. Valley. So tell me about getting started for you. Uh, oh, so as far as the tour business goes, to finish answering sure. your question, I felt ceilinged out and I made a few observations as I was working hospitality at White Rose's tasting room. I saw a number of t wine guides, tour guides and drivers, whatever their slice and model was, who were actually sitting down with their guests and I actually saw one so-called driver swallowing wine, never mind tasting with their guests, but swallowing wine. I thought to myself, that's unprofessional and the optics are bad, even if it's legal and even if it technically is okay. And you know, those of us in the industry that work with wine all the time, we know that it's kind of standard practice to spit wine out all day and no, you're probably not going to have any kind of inebriation problem from it, but the optics are bad. And I thought, 
You know, we need to be upping the professionalism here, period. And then in Ducander, I saw a tour company person fall asleep in the tasting room <laughs> with guests one day. And I thought to myself, I've never guided tours before. I have to learn a lot, I know, to be able to become good at this. But if that's the benchmark, I think I can at least do that well, if not better. So that was what really motivated me. I was ready for a change anyway. And I saw an opportunity and I saw sort of a unique fit for my skills. Mm -hmm. I love hospitality. I've lived all over the country. I've done lots of different roles and lots of, of smattering of different industries, not, not just the restaurant and painting business, but I tried my hand at a, quite a number of things over the years. I'm now in my mid-50s with a 13-year-old boy and a wife, and the combination of all of this, I thought to myself, I can connect with almost anyone. And that is the root of hospitality, is making these human connections. And so much of that thought process really has proven to be true in ways I, I couldn't have anticipated when I opened the business. And uh, has made me very happy, and I, I, from the feedback from my reviews and the guests that I've had, fortunately, so far, um, you know, that does seem to be the right, f right fit for me. Uh, to me, my, my role at this point, my most important job is to be a good matchmaker mm -hmm. because a diff different days for different people, different goals. If you are visiting our valley on your honeymoon and you really have never taken a wine tour before and you're brand new to wine, your day looks one way. If you ha are a decades-long collector and you have an enormous seller and you've spent your vacations touring the great wine worlds of the world collecting wine, that is a very different day. And the breadth of the different goals for different people, I'm very proud to say I don't believe I've ever repeated a tour. Every tour is completely unique. I do my best to read my guests. I always try to have a phone conversation, not just a text or email with guests, because I'm trying to get a sense of who you are, what you're looking for, and how I can suit you and get, make, make the best match for you, and hopefully help to empower you. Because I, I've been saying for quite a while now that it's wonderful if we can go out and ha create a, a memory day and you have a wonderful experience. I love to hear the wow or oh my god out there on a tour to me i'm checking the boxes if i hear wow or oh my god many times on the course of a tour and this is wonderful if you find a few trophies some wines you really like and you've had a wonderful day that's a great wine tour what my real goal however is to help you to along the way get a better understanding of not just finding particular wines you like but help you understand why did I like those, why these not so much, and help you to acquire the language to ask for what you are looking for so at the end of your day with me, for the rest of your wine drinking life, you will be a better consumer. You'll know how to ask for what you want and how to get what you, what you want, and you'll understand some of the, what I now have been grown to call the ABCs of wine, which is essentially wine structure. If you can understand the basics of wine structure and the understanding of what your own palate particularly enjoys, mm -hmm. know how to ask for it, you're going to be happier much more often with the bottles of wine you do sample. And I also think that there is never a fail in sampling and tasting wine. You're just learning. So you may not like something so much. You've learned that particular thing maybe you didn't like so much, or maybe you got a bigger concept of, I don't like a whole category for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. I do like a whole category for a particular reason or set of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's helping to empower the consumer so that this rather intimidating world of wine becomes much less intimidating and much more of the entertainment that I choose to view it as is that in the end of the day, yes, there's lots of intellect and yes, we can dive down deep into the serious end of wine, but people who lose sight of the fact that in the end, this is entertainment. This is supposed to be fun. And I, one thing I, I really have been enjoying watching is there, I do believe that there's a change of tone happening in the wine industry and the old elitism and the condescension and the snootiness and the intimidation is falling somewhat by the wayside. 
I've thought for a while now that that term sommelier, which has been used a little confusingly, I think, for many people over the years. For me, a sommelier is a specific job. You are working in a restaurant setting. This mm -hmm. is working the floor of a restaurant with empowered wine knowledge. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, we can take that term and look a bit broader on it. And I think particularly for our up and coming new people to the wine industry, if we think of sommelier more like party host or hostess, where, if, yes, you know your food in Bev. It's sort of presumed, if you're a very good host, host per, hostess person, um, that you know your food in Bev. But the, those who are really extraordinary at it know how to read the context in addition to the product. Mm -hmm. So is this your birthday? Is this your anniversary? Is it spring? Is it fall? Is the meal a big roast? Is it a vegetarian special? Is this a Tuesday night and your budget's 10 bucks? Is you, you're a billionaire and you want the very best bottle of wine in the world? What's the context that you're looking for? And so to me, the, this context and the experience around wine is really the art. And in some ways, it's a return. And I think that we're seeing more and more of this throughout greater society of some of the values uh, of older generations ha have profound meaning to us in this idea of the art of the table, I think is coming back around. Though I don't know that people are having as many formal dinner parties as they once did, this understanding of how to put different groups together so that the group works, how to fit the food and the bev into the context of the season and the weather of the day and the mood of the day, there's a real art form to doing this at a high level. and. I don't know what word other than perhaps party host or hostess is best for that, but I find sommelier has a baggage with it mm -hmm. that perhaps it's now time to let go of. Absolutely. Um, when you started Oregon Wine Guys, tell me about how you, how you chose to get yourself started. How did, you, how did you brand yourself? How did you break into the market? And what were some of the early challenges you oh, faced? Thank, thank you. That's a great question. Well, uh, you know, I knew what my strengths were going in and what my weaknesses were going in. I had the blessing of working with a wonderful business coach where we sat down and she asked me to list what strengths I brought to the business and what weaknesses. And then after a year in the business, we went back and reviewed what I had said and it was 100%. I knew getting into it what I know how to do well and what I don't. There's always been lots of things to learn on all fronts. Mm -hmm. My particular challenges are marketing and business administration. That is not something that I have particular skills, interest, or passion for. So I've done certainly the best I have known how to do, and I've sought help. I had a wonderful uh, branding consultant. He really took what I had in my brain in terms of image and the service I wanted to offer, and he helped to put it in both my print materials and on my online presence. I am in the process of revamping some of that, as all businesses have to do over time, but I'm still very pleased with the tone that he helped me to set. I knew all along that though I certainly like to play and love to drink as much as the next person in the industry, that really I did not want to be doing drinking tours. There are plenty of services out there doing drinking tours. I have no judgment about that. I think it's a perfectly fun thing to do if that's what people want to do and go around to wineries and groups and go drink wine. That There is a place for that and, and that's fine, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to help pe help share my passion for what's happening here in the Valley with my guests and to help them understand why this Valley has become so important and so strong in just a little over 50 years in existence. We are a baby in the wine industry, and yet we are swinging at a quality level along with the great stalwarts of the world. I am not professing that the very best Oregon Pinot Noir is necessarily standing shoulder to shoulder with the great Grand Cru Burgundies. I am saying if we put them in brown paper bags, I'll take our best stalwart Pinot Noirs and put them up against Premier Cru, and particularly as the confusion that climate change and our varying weather has had, particularly over this last 15 years, I am intrigued in amongst industry tastings when these brown bags happen mm -hmm. and 
We're confused as to which side of the pond this is being grown on, never mind which sub-AVA mm -hmm. this is being grown in, or which part of the Cote d'Or or Cote de Bone that this is being grown in. Climate change is stirring a whole lot of X factors into the wine industry that already has a whole lot of, wine, of X factors going for it. And I think the fact that we are such a young industry and our average vine age is so young that the quality level is already being talked about even in the same possible context as true fine burgundy wines mm -hmm. known for centuries as being the most sought after most expensive red wines on the planet the fact that we're even part of the conversation after 50 years is truly truly remarkable and the fact that Pinot Noir has had such a trouble finding home for itself across Europe and it was always thought that you could only make kind of a serviceable bottle not amongst the most educated and most knowledgeable people in the region but for the average consumer even well educated one the thought of Alsatian, German, Swiss, what have you old world Pinots was never talked about mm -hmm really in the same category as the truly fine burgundies and here we are in the Willamette Valley 50 slightly over years in and we're part of the conversation and mm -hmm. that's exciting to me. Um, so I saw that I brought skills of being able to connect with a huge variety of people and I like to think that I'm able to explain some of the jargon, the tech speak, and the detail that is the wine industry and make it a, more understandable and accessible to people. I, I've been saying for quite a while now that I think like any other topic that has a massive amount of information, take law or medicine or perhaps engineering or geology, there's an awful lot of jargon and vocabulary involved but we all know you can talk to, say, an MD, and they can give you a very complicated answer that doesn't really tell you what to take for your cold or whatever it is, whereas just the plain speak, you don't need to hear all the detail. You needed to hear what mattered and why it mattered. So, oh, I need a Band-Aid or, oh, I need an aspirin, you know, from the MD analogy there, um, rather than this is what's causing it and all, all that kind of stuff. For some people, they really care. For a lot of other people, they really don't care. So the ability to communicate with people um, and also the fact that I really was act and still am active in trade industry groups here and I am personally so, so curious about what we're doing here and so enthusiastic about that I continue to be pursuing and learning as much as I can every day and I'm excited about sharing that with people and by joining the trade organizations, going to the industry tastings, being a memory of, member of Winery Association and all of the contacts that that helps to foster. I know the people, or nobody can know everybody, but I know a lot of people who are in the nuts and bolts of the industry. So I knew I would have the ability to make the introductions and, and be a connector. And I felt that I had a big advantage in the fact that I had worked for well-regarded wineries and many of the people involved in the industry here thought of me as a, a fellow member of the winery industry first. And it's only been fairly recently that I'm really being recognized more as a tour guide than as somebody who works in a tasting room or works crush or whatever is part of the actual industry of the wine industry. Um, so that, I, I think to this day, is giving me a very, very big advantage because I do know so many people in the Valley and I, and I have really continued to do my best to explore the wines as much as I can. Nobody can keep up on what's going on here now. I'm told we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 550 brands or so now here, just in the Willamette, not in all of Oregon, just in the Willamette. And Charlie's take on it is the top third are doing good to great to downright world-class wine. Well, just doing the numbers on that, we have at least 130, 150 brands more probably that are checking boxes in terms of quality, and many of them are on their way up. Mm -hmm. 
There's always change in all businesses, and some rise, some fall, and that we've certainly seen that here in the Valley as well. There are some wineries that reached their apex in terms of quality a long time ago and have never really attained that again. There are others who are continuing to pursue, experiment, and strive to make the very best bottle then let the bottle price itself later on. And I find that, that amongst our best producers in the Valley, at this point often that that really is the MO. It's like, let's produce the very, very best product, then we'll figure out what we have to charge for it. Because the motivation, and I think when we lose sight of that is when we're gonna get into trouble. We're seeing some inklings of that already, where I, I was mentioning this to you earlier, Rich. I got to sit down with one of our venerable winemakers, Robert Britton, last winter, and he used a wonderful phrase when I quizzed him about this very subject. He said, well, he's concerned about this sort of rapid dive to the average, to the bottom, to create a serviceable, decent $35 bottle of Pinot Noir and be relevant on the global wine market that way. His take, and I couldn't agree with him more, is we're going to lose our way if we focus on the marketing and the consuming end and how is this going to play out monetarily and all that. We need to continue to focus on creating the very, very best possible quality wines. And unfortunately, from a business standpoint, look at the how are we going to price this, how are we going to market it, how are we going to be effective in what is now a global wine marketplace. But when we lose our way on quality, that will have repercussions that will be hard to recover from. I, I will speak to personally, when I w had never visited Oregon before, those first half a dozen Oregon wines that I tasted in Colorado and elsewhere, the quality was all great. So I, as a consumer, thought to myself, wow, they're making great wine up there, mm -hmm. or at least very good wine up there. And I, ha who had any idea that a little state hardly anybody in America has even heard of is making wines of this kind of quality. And this is coming from somebody who to this day still at home consumes about 80% old world wines. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trained on. That's where my palate preference tends to go. And frankly, bang for the buck. We are awfully challenged here in the new world to try to compete, particularly with outlying traditional growing regions in Europe. Sure, if you're shopping in Burgundy, Bordeaux, Piedmont, the Moselle, the, the prices are, you know, can be astonishing. But if you start to explore little known regions, little known varietals, I've said for a long time, if a region has been growing wine in one area for 500, 1,000 plus years, the wines go with the local foods and become a force of culture as a result. These are the great cultural wines of the world. If they're doing that and you can't pronounce the name of the grape and the wine is somewhere in the 10 to $20 range, buy it because the odds that's going to be an outstanding bottle of wine are really, really high. And what's intriguing in the old world is these little known outlawing areas, you can buy the very best bottle of wine in the region for what the entry level bottle of wine costs in a very well known region. And so that's my lens. But when I first was introduced to Willamette Valley wines, I thought to myself, wow, not only is the quality great, but I know what real Burgundy costs. I even know what California is having to charge for their Pinot Noir. And this is fair, mm -hmm. what is being asked for here. And as I learned more, I grew to understand the why these bottle price points need to be where they, they are. And they're likely to continue to go up from here. This, uh, our flagship grape, still planted to run right around 80% of our vineyard sites, um, is known, always has been, as the heartbreak grape the hardest one to grow, the hardest one to vinify into a solid bottle of wine. Following the recipe book does not necessarily mean you're gonna get something serviceable at the other end. I have found it intriguing that unless you grew up here, say Burgundy or Central Otago, the chances are you tackle Pinot Noir early in your winemaking career, it's probably pretty small. You started off with grapes that were much easier to work with, much more forgiving, where you could accomplish a good to downright grape bottle of wine 
without taking the massive kind of risk, both financially and aesthetically, as you do working with this finickiest of grapes, and I've grown to observe firsthand just how much labor goes into a bottle of wine from the Willamette Valley. And by and large, it's not just the Pinot Noir here, because this is carried over into the approximately 50 other varietals we've got growing now, where people are still trying to produce the very best possible quality. So your farming costs, your production costs, are going to be at the very top in the world. And that is partly to explain where, where we're sitting economically with our bottle price points here in the valley now. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a little daunting. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see what happens as, as time goes on here. Tell me about when you started your business, you ha I'm assuming you had some sort of notion in your head, not only of, <clears throat> excuse me, not only of the tour that you wanted to give, but of what you thought your clientele would want. So I'm curious sort of what the, your original vision was and how that's borne out in reality of what people are actually asking you for. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, by and large, it has played out pretty much the way I anticipated. Um, I'm designed around day-long tours, so I don't do it by the hour. What is a, a fulfilling, perfect day varies in length for different groups, as does the number of visits. I think for the vast majority of guests and the vast majority of my tours, three to four wineries in a day with a nice leisurely lunch break at the middle of the day is sort of an ideal way to tour. Now that said, I've had some groups where going to just two wineries in a day was absolutely perfect. And then I have had a small handful of people where it made sense to go to five, six, seven, or more in a day. If I have a serious collector or somebody who is an actual industry member, they're spitting all day, they're using their sparkling water and their neutral baguette and water cracker to try to keep their palate as, as accurate as possible. Um, I find that people who want those kinds of days, they tend to be note takers and very intellectually driven in wine. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they tend to be on shopping missions as well, where they're looking to fill cellars, whether it is for a restaurant or for a private collection. So it can make a certain amount of sense. Now for most people that would be not a right fit day to try to go to seven wineries. But if you're buying wine for a restaurant, you're only in the valley for two days, it might be your job to go to seven mm -hmm. wineries today and get as much exposure as you possibly can. So in general, my tours tend to run about seven or eight hours three to four wineries, a nice lunch break. I include a cooler full of waters. I'm a big believer in staying hydrated all day long. And I've grown to realize that I really do think, though I don't tend to drink of a lot of it outside of this context personally, I find just neutral sparkling water really helpful in keeping your palate alive over the course of a wine tour day. I thought before I opened the business, and, and it's just been reinforced doing it, that Touring is really its own endeavor. It's a bit different than just going out tasting. It's certainly different than just going out drinking. It is a whole day, and I like to treat it sort of the way a well-thought-through meal is treated, where there is an opening, there is a middle, there is a close, kind of like an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. I try to fit the wine styles the ambiances and the geography all together so that this makes a certain amount of sense. Some of it is very linear and planning and thinking through and some of it is a little bit more intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to design itineraries and virtually all of my guests will get an itinerary, you know, we will have a discussion. I will put together a suggested itinerary for them, link up the websites to the brands I'm suggesting so they can just zip through and get a sense of what I'm mm -hmm. suggesting. And I find probably two thirds or so of the tours go more or less the way the original itinerary was designed. Uh, another third or so of the tours, first stop of the day, the itinerary is getting ripped up because I spot 
that for whatever reason, what was being planned was not going to deliver the best experience for this particular group of people. So let's make a couple phone calls real quick and change up the day a little bit and get them what they really are looking for, even if they don't realize what they're really looking for. And some of it is knowing what's available, because I have a good handle on what's available in our valley. There's always more to learn. but. You don't know what you don't know, and there are so many unique experiences here. <clears throat> being, being a good matchmaker, that, that is, it always comes back to that to me, that that is the most important thing that I do, mm -hmm. is try, doing my darndest to read what the guest is looking for and meeting that need for them and hopefully exceeding mm -hmm. what, what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so. The tour days change a little bit, depending, and kind of sometimes a lot a bit. Um, I also include on the note of palate uh, accuracy and rehabbing, I include as a part of my tour a charcuterie board that I really aim for the last stop of the day when lunch is in distant memory. And this is going back to when I often talk about the structure of wine with people. You've had so many structural components, be it the acids, the alcohols, the tannins if there were any residual sugar left in, in your wines, all bathing your palate. And for most of us, tasting lots and lots of wine side by side by side, unless you work in the industry, that's probably not something you are normally doing. And you are really overwhelming your palate with all of these compounds. And over the course of the day, of course, we're going to find that it's going to take more and more impact to get the same result on a fatigued palate. Mm -hmm. So I include charcuterie at the end of the tour to try to throw a little salt, a little fat, a little acidity, some, something to help revive your very tired palate. And I always caution my guests to not so much trust your palate towards the end of the day. The wines at the end of the day, once your tire, palate is kind of tired, because you need more impact to get the same result, the wines that are bigger, bolder, boozier, inevitably going to stand out mm -hmm. after you've been tasting all day long. And it may be that it is a wonderful bottle of wine, but it may also be that it's not particularly your style of wine, because perhaps you like a more middle or perhaps delicate kind of a wine, and yet that wine that was actually really heavy duty wine struck you as being kind of modest because your palate was so tired by the end of the day. So I always caution people to be particularly thoughtful as we move through a tour day in terms of your purchasing decision and try to take an opportunity to taste again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that, you know, I, I try to be thoughtful on that arc of the day and that includes thinking about where the last stop is going to be with the knowledge that you're going to have a tired palate by then. So now I'm going to have to come up with something that maybe is a little bit more over the top from what your normal comfort zone is, but now it's going to be just right mm -hmm. for the arc of the tour day. Interesting. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. <laughs> Tell me about from the industry side. How have, how have they received your business and businesses like yours, and how have you sort of found and developed and maintained relationships with the places you want to take your guests? Oh, that's a great, it's a great question. Well, I realized, because I had been working in the tasting rooms, that uh, tour companies are rather on probation by the wineries throughout the valley. Um, the, the smaller brands with smaller, more intimate facilities are particularly sensitive to this. Uh, as I said earlier in the interview, I have absolutely no gripes, quibbles, or anything but thinking it's fun to go out drinking and you want to have your bachelorette party out at wine country. This is, as they say, a thing these days, and I'm fine with that. I think that there are right ways to do that. There are wineries that are geared up staffed up and facilitated up to accommodate exactly that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where that kind of, again, it's being a good matchmaker if you are the driver or the organizer of a tour that is going out drinking, well, do, don't go to the wineries that have a hushed environment and a sophisticated clientele and we're parsing the nuances of the science behind Pinot Noir in hushed tones. That's not where to take your guests. You want to take them to some place that's got a lively atmosphere, maybe some rock and music going on, other entertainment going on. 
because that's the right fit for that kind of group. So I knew all along that there's this rather probationary because in a small intimate tasting room, a loud drunken group can ruin it for everyone mm -hmm. and that will hurt your sales for the day. At the end, this is a business and these tasting rooms are open to sell wine. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be open. So they're very cautious about tour companies. I knew this going into it and I spent three months before I opened to the public touring the valley, introducing myself in my new hat as a tour company owner and to explain my model to the brands that at least at the beginning, and this has been true to this day, I plan on, I, I will start with just one vehicle and I will lead all tours personally. Back when I first started, I was running a Cadillac Escalade where I could accommodate six. I've since gone to a Lexus GX, so four is my maximum accommodation. I grew to realize twos and fours is what works best for the model that I do. I'm happy to have a single person, by the way, but, but twos and fours is, is the bulk bulk of my business, and I find that perfect size groups to do what I do in the edutainment front of the wine industry. Because I think this, on that note of it being fun, yes, let's learn something, because there is an awful lot to learn, but it should done through the lens of let's have a really fun time doing it. Um, so I went around and I introduced myself. I d explained the model that I was uh, attempting to, to execute and now have executed, and that I would do everything I could to be a great communicator, because that was the biggest complaint I heard about the tour companies, is they'd show up unannounced, big groups of people, or at the very end of the day, very beginning of the day, all with no communication, or they make an appointment and then they don't show, or they don't make an appointment when they are supposed to make one, all that sort of thing. Communication, bottom line. Mm -hmm. So to this day, I do my absolute best to, I always make sure, even if I've just got one or two people with me, the wineries know we're coming. Now, if I have to change the day, they will also get a call saying, itinerary has changed for the day, we will come next time, mm -hmm. or another time, or what have you. So that communication front, I've continued to focus very, very strongly on. Um, I also do it to get my guests better experiences. It's multi-pronged multi intention. I want the wineries to know that we're coming. I've told the wineries all along, I am not a discount model. I'm a full experience model. Uh, in fact, I'm a red carpet treatment model. I want you to roll the red carpet out for my guests. I'm not looking for freebies. I'm not looking for discounts. I'm looking for your best. Mm -hmm. I want your best hospitality. I want your best wines. I bet you want the best possible experience that you can provide for us. And you're competing against an awful lot of great experiences here. So people often ask me, how do I pick where to go? I have consent formal relationships with about 90 wineries right now. As I said earlier, I visit three to four a day, and every tour is different. So I only visit an individual winery periodically when I feel that it is the right fit. I do try to spread it out. Mm -hmm. I try to make geographic sense and certainly listen to what my guests are looking for. All of that said, do candor, there are a handful of wineries that are so consistently up, way, way above average and so consistently over deliver for me and have such a strong reason for being, as I like to say, because that's one of my qualifiers is yes, good to great wine, yes, good to great hospitality, yes, good to great ambiance, but now you also have a reason for being. I'm not saying you can't have extraordinary wines and extraordinary experiences in one of the projects that is being offered by a super empowered wealthy ind individual who wants to preen and show off and all of that, but that doesn't give me enough of a story. It, to me, it's just, it's not what Oregon is all about. It's not what the Willamette Valley wine industry is all about. It doesn't mean it's not a great experience, but you're yes, less useful to, to, from my lens of thinking, if that, that is the, the model that you're employing. So yeah, there are a group of wineries that I tend to lean on a bit more than others, but I really spread it around the valley. Um, and I also, on particularly people who have not toured here before, I go to pretty, uh, an effort anyway, to, to show the, the, 
beginning of diversity of what we have to offer here because that is another thing that so excites me about here is in this one region the diversity of wines and experiences that we are offering is really amazing I really believe it takes three to four full tour days just to get an overview of styles not individual brands just what are the possible styles even the varietals you in four days you won't even taste every varietal we're growing here and that is part of the beauty of uh, the bounty of this region it's just it's just remarkable and it's getting better all the time on that front and I think that that's part of the next chapter to come here we've always been known for our experimental nature here and our uh, willingness to push the envelope and to try things all in this objective to produce the very best pro possible product I think that that if anything that's accelerating now mm -hmm. and a as more vineyard land is being put into play as more brands are growing as climate change is having an impact on all of agriculture the Willamette is being exceptionally responsive and exceptionally aware of this Does that answer the question absolutely I'm curious you, you mentioned uh, the kind of probationary aspect of, of tour groups and, <laughs> yeah. and sort of the kind of the, the necessary evil perhaps of it too, from a winery side. So sure. tell me if that's changing and, and where you see sort of the future as, as wine, is, wine is growing in the state, as tourism is growing in the state, what is the future of what you do? Well, that's, a, that's also a really good question. You know, this is, a, it always has been, but it is going to continue to become more and more competitive of, of a business global wine is daunting at this point I'm told that there's something like a million brands of wine on the global marketplace I mean that that is humbling when you start to think of that um, I am told that something like 70% of our wineries are not even cash flow positive never mind any kind of return on the initial capital investment here that is not sustainable. There are a lot, a lot of brands here that I think are not going to last over the long term. They just may not know it yet. Um, because all the passion in the world doesn't keep the lights on. One of my, my concerns and something that I think our whole valley should be thinking about and concerned about a lot more than we are is I, uh, my understanding between our major warehouse bonded facilities in the valley, we're sitting on something like 3 million cases of wine. Your accounting firm may think your 1996 Pinot Gris is still alive. Unless you're a particularly fine maker, the chances are it's not. So you're going to come to a rude awakening that a lot of your so-called assets are valueless at this point. So you were already in financial trouble and now the wines that you've been storing long term are not viable to sell. Now what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So we have a bit of an oversupply problem here. It's not talked about to the consumer very much for obvious reasons. We have seen an extraordinary amount of new vineyard land going online. There's a lot of young vine sites out there. I know, know, and much to the relief of our local industry here, this trend of rosé being popular has been a big boon to our local industry because what are you going to do with your young vine Pinot Noir that's not showing a lot of uh, nuance and a lot of complexity yet? Well, you can throw it into a sparkler or a rosé and make a perfectly lovely, wonderful, delicious bottle of wine out of it, and you can charge a much lower price point for it and everyone's happy but um, we're, this, this is a growing pains time I think for us here in the valley I think it's much much harder for small players to have any hope at all of getting in as a by the bootstraps uh, you know low, low financing dream in a prayer sweat equity kind of a play I think that you're going to be pretty doomed unless you're particularly talented, lucky, hardworking, all of that sort of thing. And I don't underestimate luck in any endeavor. Um, but, you know, that said, I think that on the upside, we are being more and more recognized on the global marketplace all the time. The number of Willamette Valley wines that are getting on the lists of the super empowered critics 
is extraordinary. When you think about the tiny percentage of wine on the domestic production side, never mind the global production side that Oregon Wine is doing, the number of wineries that are getting their wines on people's top 100 lists is really amazing. And I see in my own service, people are coming not just from all over America. I more or less anticipated the domestic market. I've been a little surprised as to where the dominance of my guests have been. Um, but I'm also intrigued as the number of international guests I have hosted in uh, almost three years of the tour business now. People are, are we're getting on the radar, and uh, particularly Asia. I am seeing an awful lot of interest from the Asian countries. I mean, Japan, I think, has always had a certain uh, resonance here and the sister cityhood with Portland and all of that sort of thing. But I'm also seeing people coming from Hong Kong, coming from Singapore, coming from China. We are making a, a mark on a market that is massive, mm -hmm. and that's exciting. As I touched on a little bit earlier, I have, though I moved here and first was drawn here, as so many people were by Pinot Noir, it's been living here and working in the industry and tasting, tasting, tasting for the light bulb to go off where I realized, oh, you know, if it grows in a northern latitude region in Europe and it has thrived there for hundreds if not thousands of years, due to our microclimates and our massive diversity and just how enormous this AVA is, we're going to find a home for you. We just don't know where yet. We don't maybe know exactly how we're going to farm a particular varietal or how we're going to vinify it, where it's going to grow best in the valley. But I am convinced at this point that there is so much diversity here in terms of microclimates that the sky is the limit in terms of cool climate grapes. And this is intriguingly being complicated by climate change. And I think that we're already seeing some visionaries in the valley. And who knows, none of us has a crystal ball. And despite all of the genuine concerns that our science community is telling us about climate change, the but part that also is not mentioned is we are one massive volcanic explosion away from an ice age. Doesn't matter what human beings are doing, Mother Nature always has supremacy here. And I certainly wouldn't argue that we're in a grave situation and that human beings are absolutely undisputedly responsible for a great deal of our climate change current issue. But none of this is, is set in stone. We don't know what's going to happen next tomorrow, never mind 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Mount Hood could decide to wake up tomorrow morning and blow her top just like Mount St. Helens did in 1980 and do it to a point where we now have a global ice age come on. We don't know, but we have to go on trends and what the science community is telling us and they're telling us it's going to keep getting hotter and drier or if nothing else, more extreme weather events. So we're going to be, and we have certainly seen this with creating successive records in 2014, 15, and 16 in terms of hot and dry growing conditions here in the valley, that we're seeing a lot of wine growers thinking to themselves, well, you know what, what we've been doing with Pinot Noir, if this continues, this isn't going to work for us. So now instead of planting my new vineyard site, on a 400 foot, 500 elevation southwest facing bowl to try to catch all that afternoon heat in prayer that we're going to get ripe enough this year. Now I'm going to plant at 900 feet facing northeast because I want to burn my fruit and I want complexity and nuance and I want real typicity from Pinot Noir. I can do that, but I'm going to have to think through how I'm going to do it and I'm going to have to cool off my growing climate back to where. Oregon was when the industry first started here. I mean, it's been pretty extraordinary when you look at the meteorological climate change here in the valley from when vines were planted in 65 to where we are now. We're in a whole different world in terms of our, what our average season is giving us. Mm -hmm. um, some of this has made for arguably vintages of a lifetime. 
from a certain palate's lens, mm -hmm. if you are looking for wines that are very accessible in their youth, are very fruit forward, very smooth and juicy, these hot and dry years and have, have some weight from alcohol, these hot and dry years, they show really well in their youth when most of the wineries are demonstrating the wines anyway. Consumers love this stuff. Critics love this stuff. I'm finding it increasingly intriguing that I have spotted, uh, certainly far from the only one, that we have a distinct industry palette here which is different than the average consumer palette. Most of the folks in the industry are chasing the wines from the cold and wet vintages, high in acid, low in alcohol, oftentimes very bashful in their youth. You don't really want to try these wines the first five, seven years of their life. They're too shrill. Mm -hmm. Set them down in your cellar for a while. See what happens seven, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. This creates magical Pinot Noir from the typical lens of what Pinot Noir was thought of being mm -hmm. historically. Whereas I'm finding most consumers, having been raised on domestic by and large, new world wines, very fruit forward, very alcohol driven, often with a good layering of oak on top of it. These hot and dry vintages are certainly more familiar mm -hmm. to most palates. And uh, I view it as our job as educators working within the industry to help people to understand what are the characteristics of the wine? How did this wine get these characteristics? What do I prefer? And then how are the wines going to behave over time? Because these are living substances that are changing on an arguably hourly, daily, weekly, never mind annual basis. I am never endingly intrigued with this enigmatic grape of Pinot Noir that the very, I'll have a, you know, I don't often buy by the case, but once in a while I'll have a half a case or a case put down. Open up a bottle, two days later, open up a s bottle from the very same case. The fact that the barometric pressure has changed, my mood has changed, the dinner table food has changed, the wine now seems like of quite different mm -hmm. substance. And that is part of the aliveness of all wines, but Pinot Noir in particular with its sort of chameleon-like and ever-changing uh, nature um, you know, and so to me, that's something to cherish, and, and, and that's part of why people get on this Pinot hunt is its nuance, its subtlety, its finickiness, its uh, downright frust frustration sometimes, because we've all had that very expensive bottle of Pinot Noir that disappointed the heck out of us, and that can be really, really frustrating. And then we've had that bottle that has stuck in our memory bank. I have an ongoing comment that I realized, and it was working at a particular winery. I had thought for years and years that this is hedonism, and I'm good with that. We're tracing pleasure, right? These are things that smell and taste and are very appealing to us. Great, sign me up. There are a lot of things we do in life that are for hedonism, and I think human beings are programmed to enjoy pleasure. Go ahead and, and, and embrace that. But I've always had a sense that wine was a little different than a lot of the other hedonistic endeavors that we as humans tend to chase. And it was while pouring at a particularly fine brand where I thought all the wines were a very similar quality to each other. They were different in their expressiveness, but the quality was right there. And as we are wont to do here in the Valley, I was pouring for guests talking about some science aspect of wine, and at some point, and I would have an engaged group who were interested in talking to me, and so I would lose somebody. I'd watch their first telltale, their body language would change, they kind of relaxed down, and their eyes would roll back, and they're gone. And I got brave enough sometimes with certain guests to say, you know, I don't care that you weren't listening to me talk about oak barrels or whatever it is I was talking about, but that wine clearly was different to you than anything else in the lineup today. So let's talk about that. What was different? Invariably, two, one of two statements would happen. It reminded me of, or it made me feel. So I've come to the conclusion that wine, at its nuanced, enigmatic, the chase is really after emotives. Something that can conjure a feeling. The way great music can, the rate 
great visual art can, the way great mother, mother nature's displays can, can conjure these emotions and these connectiveness, the genuine memories. I mean, they say olfactory memory is this, this primal level where it registers for us in ways that most other sensory experiences don't quite latch on the same sort of way. And I think that's a big part of what's driving wine is because we are driven on the olfactory. Sure, the palate's giving us information as well, but it's our olfactory sensations that are really feeding the bulk of the information up to our brain and interpreting it. And I've grown to realize, yeah, that is actually what I'm really chasing. Sure, I love a delicious bottle of wine that just brings hedonism. I've also grown to realize that those emotive wines cannot be linearly identified or created because the same bottle won't do that to you over and over again. That bottle that made you swoon the once, you may still love it forever on it, but it won't hit you in quite the same way again. And again, to go to that music analogy, it's like hearing a lyric for the very first time. You've been heard this song dozens of times and you really like it, but you never really heard what it was saying. And then one day you really hear it and it made it mean so much more to you because you really heard the song for the first time with what all of its content had to tell you. So this idea of an emotive, a, a, a sensory experience as an emotive, to me that, that's where our objective is. And the more we can learn to talk to each other that way, I find it, though I talked a lot about how much I love the intellect end of this, we also can over talk some of this particularly when we dive deep into some aspects of wine. For most people, diving past very superficial chemistry, glaze over, nobody wants to hear this stuff. Unless you're a real science bet, that's your kind of lens that you look at life, most people, that's not what they want to hear about. It's the storytelling around it that people, I think, are really interested in. And if you can catch that emotive, help create that emotive and it go, circling back to the idea of a great party host, mm -hmm. that's encapsulating the feeling, the sense of the day is that person who knows how to put the group together, the food together, the bev together, and wow, it all comes together to be more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm warning off today, this is awesome. <laughs> oh good, I'm glad. <laughs> So I'm curious, clearly you're, you're, you're still fairly new to the region, you're still yeah. fairly new to the industry, but clearly you've given a lot of thought and done a lot of research into Oregon wine history itself. So tell me about your experience learning about Oregon wine history and how you sort of parlay that to your guests and sort of what their response is. You talk about a certain surface level in terms of sensory experience. How much do they want to know about Oregon and Oregon's wine history? That varies super widely, guests to guests. I'm very fortunate, I think, that with the help of my branding assistant, I tend to attract the right people for the model that I have. I find most of my guests really do want to learn. They're at different levels of how, where they're starting out at and what they want to learn about, but yeah, it's coming from a, an intellect and a curiosity, and, I, and I'm told that often up front, because I will ask people, how did you find me, and why did you decide, decide on, on riding with me rather than one of the other tour companies? And inevitably, it would be something about how they wanted somebody who really knew about the local industry. They wanted somebody who could explain things to them, somebody who could show them things that they couldn't find by themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's always been a big part of my objective is to, is to try to show you things that you couldn't have found on your own, even if you're a good researcher. And I do find a group, most of my guests have done a lot of homework. I, there's no bigger compliment that I feel like I can get that we looked at all 18 tour companies that are members of Willamette Valley Winery Association and we called you. So we're making the right, it's the matchmaking thing. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're reacting, hopefully responding to what I am advertising as what I do, that they want somebody to be thoughtful about it. They want somebody to help explain. They want somebody to help them find things that they couldn't have found on their own, even if they are good researchers. A lot of times, I am, as I started at the beginning, or early question about where my fortes are, I knew all along branding and marketing, getting the word out, that was gonna be a major challenge for me. I, in due candor, was never on social media until I opened my 
tour business. And I was told, Charlie, you don't have a choice. <laughs> it's sort of like the old Yellow Pages. If you're not on social media, you're not a business. Mm -hmm. And I knew back when I owned my painting business, if you didn't have a Yellow Pages ad, it didn't have to be a big one, but you had to be listed or you're not legitimate. Mm -hmm. Well, now in our modern world, if you're not up on the internet, you're not a real company. But I also knew that with my lack of tech skills and lack of advertising budget and all of that, chances are that wasn't going to really drive mm -hmm. the business. And I've always thought and continue to think that the best small businesses really are built on referrals. And I do know that nice people will refer you to other nice people in the corollary is in effect. Um, so I'm very blessed in that by and large, I get really wonderful, really nice people. And I see, I've, in May, I will have hit three years open to the public. And I am already seeing quite a bit of repeat business and referral business. I'm very blessed in that I have one couple who's about to take their sixth tour with me in two and a half years. They design their whole vacation. They actually, they don't. Charlie designs their whole vacation for them. They live in LA. They don't have to take. They've traveled the world chasing wine, and they grew to realize they love Oregon. They love the wines here, and they don't have to, take, to do a time change. They can just come up for the weekend, come explore with me for a day or two. I'll set them up with things that they've never done before on every single time they visit, and it's my pleasure to do that. And by the way, that is the other aspect that I do for my guests. I view you as part of, of Oregon Wine Guide's family. Once you have signed up for a tour with me, I am now at your service. Anything I can do to be a concierge for you, whether it be restaurant tips, lodging tips, wine bar tips, to the best of my knowledge ability, I will do my best to try to help people put together the very best experience here in the valley. I do view myself as an ambassador for the Willamette as a whole. And I, I just before I pulled in to do this interview today, I had a gal call who was looking for a date that I already had booked. And my response to her was, I'm so sorry that I'm booked. Are you, you really are looking for a private tour with somebody thoughtful who is going to put together a good day for you? Yes, that's what you're looking for. Okay, let me give you some names of people who I think are doing a good job. Let me help you mm -hmm. to get what you're looking for because I can't take care of you. Doesn't mean I'm just gonna send you away. I want you taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are other people who are doing a very nice job. So like the wineries respect the others who are worthy of respect, there are some colleagues who are doing wonderful tours out here in the Valley. And I'm happy to refer over to them. And I'm very lucky in that I get the referrals back, back in place when they are booked up or on vacation or what have you, they'll refer people over to me. So yeah, that, that whole marketing, branding, and all, and, and as technology has come to rule uh, uh, mer <laughs> mercantile throughout the world it, it is a real catch up. And I think it, uh, maybe, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but perhaps it is uh, particularly challenging for those of us in the 55 and up range, you know, when you didn't grow up with technology, I don't know that for most of us is ever going to be second nature. It's just something you accept and you do do the best you can with, and that, that's which is what I've done. So, given all that we've talked about today, what's the most rewarding part of your job? What do you like about it the most? What brings you the most pleasure? What brings? That's a great question. I think. It is either the verbal or the expression that I get from people when it's really gone away above and beyond. I talk about this on tour sometimes as well. I can lay, set the table and be as great a matchmaker as possible. One of the things about doing that is if you're thoughtful enough about it, and then you also are open, you create a certain amount of synergy or synchronicity. And the number of times where I've taken people out on a tour and they have either run into somebody that they knew or run into somebody who has a PhD in a subject that they also have a, you know, the commonalities and the connections of experience and the, 
there's no way I could have known this. Mm -hmm. But the, the sort of mystery of this human connection and connectivity, I think wine is, is a, a part of the greater subject of the table. And I don't separate food and wine very much in the sense that for most of us, I believe wine is a thin sauce for our meals. Sure, you may drink outside of your table some. You may have a glass before cooking and you may have a glass after. Maybe you're sitting on a porch and just popping down some wine. That, that's all a wonderful thing to do. But I think most wine is used in context of a meal. Maybe you open it as you're starting to cook, but you're probably snacking at the same time while you're cooking. So to me, this is all part of the table experience and the beauty of the table experience and the art of the table is bringing people together. And particularly in our current climate, I am on a soapbox these days of kindness and communication. And I push back on our current tone in America right now. I think it is very healthy to disagree. I think it's very healthy to be passionate. I also think it is very healthy to listen and to learn and to inquire and to know no matter how much you know, there's always more things to learn and listening to other people is the only way that we're gonna have dialogue and really achieve anything. So th this idea of bringing people together and communicating with one another, no matter what our beliefs, no matter what our backgrounds, no matter how we were raised, where we were raised, this moving forward, wine is a tiny part of this idea, more important idea, of this is a global world and we all have to learn how to get along. And it's long past time as a species for us to learn how to cooperate. I think we made a species mistake and this is a little esoteric and off the wine subject, I understand, but I think as a species we made a mistake years ago and I know people would argue with me on this, but I genuinely believe if we were truly cooperative, we could all be thriving on a really remarkable level, all eight billion of us. But we've decided that tribalism, warfare, conquering, greed, and all of that serves the species better. I disagree most emphatically on that. One thing I'm finding very interesting in terms of the expectations I set when I opened the tour business, two things I got really wrong. The first thing was demographically my average age. I really thought it would be rare for an under 45 year old person at my price point, my model, what I'm doing, my age, all of that is going, it's mostly going to be people 45 and up and I'm, it's fine, that's great. And yeah, a whole lot of my business certainly is 45 and up. But I was really surprised and continue to be intrigued and this summer the percentages have even gone up from my first two um, in terms of the 29 to 35s and even younger than 29. What I'm finding is really intriguing with this demographic. With me, I find by and large, they're very well traveled. They're very accomplished academically. I get a whole lot of power couples. He just got an MD, she just got a law degree. He's in tech, she's a geologist. They have traveled the world, oftentimes with their families. They have advanced degrees. They are putting, oftentimes putting off children for a while. They're looking for experiences. They're global citizens, additionally. I much more get asked by the younger demographic about farming practices. They're very concerned about how a wine is being farmed and made. Much more concerned about that than was it done within the borders of the United States. They would rather buy a wine from Friuli or from Greece that was grown organically than grown something just because it's red, white, and blue. In fact, they would say one grown red, white, and blue, but grown conventionally, I don't want it because of what it's doing ecologically. And I'm finding this very, very intriguing. So that was the first thing I got wrong. And the second thing was length of time before, prior to booking. I thought most people would be very well planned on these vacations. And I envisioned my demographic to be hyper, busy, type A, very go-getter, achieving type people, probably have an assistant helping them out. And I sure get a plenty of those kinds of folks. 
but the, who we are planning weeks, if not months, in advance. And I certainly get that. The number of times I get a call at 9 o'clock at night saying, Charlie, are you available tomorrow morning? <laughs> Far exceeds that. So I have learned, never go home with a dirty car. <laughs> <laughs> Be ready for a tour tomorrow. You don't know if you're working or not. <laughs> Love it. All right, one last question for you. Uh, as you may or may not know, Linfield has a wine studies program now. We are having wine studies majors coming out of the school and be graduating in the next couple of years. So I'd like to ask people in the industry, um, based on your perspective, what would your words of wisdom be to someone who you met who was coming out of a program like that who wanted to get their start in the Oregon wine industry? Huh. I guess a number of them. Um, one would be to realize what you're getting into on the plus and the negative sides of it. Like every industry, there, there are really, really great things about it and really challenging things about it. Um, we are historically known for most positions in the wine industry as being a very low pay paying industry, despite the average bottle price point. Um, so that is a kind of grim reality of the wine industry, is that this is not, a, in general, not a very highly compensated business, so there is that limitation. That would be the, the, probably the biggest negative side to it that I would say. Um, far, far more positive. I mean, I'm in the industry, so I've made my own decision on, on that one. Um, you know, I mean, I know that most people in the industry, particularly those who are really exceeding in the wine industry, the fact that you were able to exceed in this very, very difficult industry means to me that you probably could be doing financially far, far better applying your same set of skills to something else. So people usually are making a conscious decision to be in the wine industry. Almost everybody in the industry started with a love for the product first. You know, I, I think unless you happen to be born into a family who's in the business, it's almost everybody who's working in the industry actively, they're passionate about the product first. Mm -hmm. And there's few, I think that there's few endeavors where it's pr so product driven where people are doing they're working in this business around a product because they love the product mm -hmm. maybe again going back to the, maybe music is another industry where people are willing to sacrifice income stream because they love the product so that's one of my cautions you know and this is sort of on a bigger picture american priorities i you know i think that this is pro unlikely to change moving forward. We, we don't tend to prioritize people who make things anymore. Um, coming out of my contracting era, I saw that in terms of what is happening to our skilled laborers in America. The value that we pay, place on people who can build things mm -hmm. has really dived down and the value that we've placed on people pushing papers around has really gone up. And I question that, and I wonder if, and hope it, I personally hope it doesn't continue in terms of our priorities. I'm also wondering on the cost benefit that everything brings. I talked about my challenges with technology as a person. One thing I think that's going to be interesting more socially and culturally that does feed into the wine business very directly is I hope and I think the ability to connect with people and the Ability to be a good communicator and to speak, I hope and think is going to become much more valuable. So I hope that people who are educators, I hope that people who work in restaurants, I hope people that work at wineries, I hope that the travel agents of the world all start to become more valued. Mm -hmm. The docents of the world. I mean, all of these sorts of, of endeavors that historically have all been very low paying, which to me means we're not valuing it. Mm -hmm. If we're not paying for it, we're not valuing it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping, and I'm the cheerleader for our priorities to change on that front, because I think that it is an extremely undervalued skill to be able to public speak, to be able to educate people, 
particularly in an entertaining fashion. Mm -hmm. And we all remember our teachers in school, the handful that were really blessed with the skill of communication to a point where it wasn't a chore to go learn, it was a joy to go learn. Mm -hmm. And I hope and think, pray perhaps, that this is going to become more of a focus. I see it amongst a lot of the younger folks that tour with me. That's why they're looking for me because, or someone like me, to find them because they know that going online only gets them a superficial lens. You don't know till you know, until you visit, and all the pictures in the world will never quite replicate being someplace in person. I, I am also encouraged by how dominant a sector of our economy travel has become. Um, you know, it's, it's that everything has a cost-benefit. Sure, by traveling, we're throwing lots more carbon into the atmosphere, so on a climate level, that's really lousy. But in a bringing us to the table together, this is essential. We have to learn about one another's cultures, histories, backgrounds, geographies, and cherish the other as much as we cherish ourselves. You know, to me, that, that's, that's when human beings become more evolved, is when we go. Diversity is what makes everything so exciting. Homogeneity is oh so boring and not desirable at all. And this Willamette Valley wine industry is, is leading the charge for diversity, whether it's personalities, ambiance, wine styles, approach to marketing, you name it. The diversity and, and the inclusiveness, mm -hmm. the fact that we are so conscious of farming, and the fact that we have these, for lack of a better word, do-gooder organizations here that are providing health care for our vineyard workers, that are providing housing for people coming to learn here, mm -hmm. that are offering educational experiences to people all over the world. The fact that we've become so well known for Pinot Camp and taking people who are already very accomplished in our industry and helping them up their game to learn even more. That's what we're all about here. And, and that combined with the, the goal to quality always being our in our sights as this is the most important thing, that idea of inclusivity, quality, we're all in this together. Let's learn from one another. That's what's exciting about the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So with all the questions that I have for you, okay. uh, we obviously covered a lot. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything else you want to say here at the end that uh, we didn't talk about? Yeah. Well, I guess, I, first of all, thank you for having me. I feel rather humbled and honored to be here. I. Uh, I was aware of this archive project, but I will confess that I did not dive deep and really learn a whole lot about it before coming in, though I did do enough homework to realize how prominent, how esteemed, and, and uh, how profound the other people who sat in this seat are. And I don't know that I hold a candle to many of the people who have sat here. I just feel very... Uh, uh, lucky to be included, and I thank, thank you for sure. that. Absolutely, thank um, you. And I guess I would end on a note of, of optimism and excitement more than anything else, because I think there's so much troublesome going on in the world that, that for us to hang our hats, if you will, on, on the light, lighter and more optimistic sides, I just continue to be absolutely over impressed with collegiality, sharing of information, experimentation, intellectual curiosity. These are the forces driving this industry mm -hmm. and, and it hasn't changed. Sure, there are some big, big deep pocketed corps coming in starting to play the game here. We may see more of out of typical operations showing up in the valley over time doesn't bother me a bit because I think they're outliers. Mm -hmm. And even if they wind up on a volume sense taking over more market share, I don't think that they are going to 
be our identity by any, any means. And I th particularly think so amongst the younger folks coming up, mm -hmm. the last thing they're looking for is corporations. Mm -hmm. The best thing that we can deliver is these genuine family businesses. And that, that's what we were rooted in to begin with. This never started as corporations. Our, all of our early founders started off by and large with very meager means and big ideas and very small bank account and lots of prayers. And uh, I think that one of the things, and I know that the archive likely has covered some of this, but people often talk about the story of the history of the Valley and the prominence of some of our early players, and I don't downplay any of, of that. What often is under, I think, observed is the times within which the original founders of the wine industry showed up in the valley where we're talking mid to late 1960s, early 70s. Back to the land movement, folks. Don't forget this. This was part, this wine wasn't the whole deal. This was about a lifestyle. And it continues for many, many of us in the business that this is a, life, a lifestyle choice. This is about growing food, about producing beverages, keeping bees, staying close to the land, being in touch with Mother Nature. Those priorities haven't left. And, and that's what we're rooted in. And that's why the roots are so deep, too. Absolutely. I think that that's all the words wisdom I really have for what they're worth. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, thank you so much thank you. for seeing with us today, for adding your voice to our stories here. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Oh, thank you.